Welcome to Mears Chapel United Methodist Church. I am Reverend Brendan Newman, the senior pastor here, and along with our wonderful staff, Lauren Allred, Director of Music Ministries, Brian, Director of Youth and Discipleship, Kim Hastings with our Play School, we're all working together to bring you online worship. Our entire mission at Mears Chapel is to connect. Connect people to God, people with people, and resources with needs. And we hope that you join us with our many Facebook Live posts um, throughout the week with devotions and prayers and um, youth group. Um, join in on Wednesday nights with Zoom youth group or out in the parking lot on Sunday nights. And every Sunday right now we're having outdoor worship at 10 a.m. in addition to our online worship. Let us pray. Lord, we remember today that you are unchanging. You are good, merciful, slow to anger, and abound in steadfast love. Your forgiveness and your presence with us gives us courage. Draw us closer to you that we will be both encouraged and thus become courage bearers, helping others to live fully. Restore our souls. Open up our ears, our minds, our hearts, and our spirits to receive you today. Amen. On Sunday, October 25th, we are going to have a drive-through fall festival. 
You can drive through to pick up um, a meal for you and your kids and your family. Um, There'll be decorations, goodie bags, and a lot more fun. More details to come, but the Fall Festival, 4 to 6 p.m. on October 25th. Hey everybody, I am super excited about something awesome our church is doing. On Saturday, November the 7th, our church is having an outdoor movie night. Picture it, a 20-foot blow-up screen right here. And you, in your cars, parked right here. Looking at, watching the movie, The Wizard of Oz. I'm going to get you, my pretty. <laughs> a great family film. Saturday, November 7th, right here in the church parking lot. It's going to be awesome. Save the date. More details to come. Outdoor, drive through movie night. Good morning, guys. Welcome to church. Um, today, we are going to talk a little bit about Psalm 23 um, that was written by David, and we're going to talk about the part where he says, he restoreth my soul. And what exactly does that mean to restore my soul? Um, well, first of all, our body needs rest. Um, we need to relax. We need to let our body relax. We need to let our brain relax. And part of that is restoring our soul. So just taking a deep breath and just relaxing is what helps us on our way to restoration. Another thing is reflection. Um, we need to look at how God wants us to live. Are we doing that? Are we doing the things that he taught us to do and wants us to do? And part of that is living through the Ten Commandments. Um, the part restoration, we have to have both rest and reflection to lead to restoration. Um, and what we want with that is we want to be excited for Jesus again. We want to be following his word and anything that we have maybe neglected in the past. This is our chance to energize ourselves and to be really excited about living life the way Jesus wants us to live. Um, and he wants us to live with kindness, with grace, with love, with hope, um, so many of those things. And we just need to, once again, restore our soul and re-energize ourselves so we can go out and share um, his word with other people. Um, we have to be restored by God. We cannot restore ourselves, and that's what we really need to understand. Um, David knew God was with him. He knew God cared for him, and he knew God was going to always be by his side. Um, there was no battle that was too big that he could not face without God, and that's how it is in our life. No matter what we're facing, as long as we have God on our side, we've got it covered. All right, thanks, guys. Have a great day. We turn now to our prayer time today. First, I do want to say we have a praise. Baby Isaac is home from the hospital and doing really well. So that's just a praise and joy as we join together. We need to continue to remember Blake and Becky Cummins and their little one, little baby Cummins, um, who is in the NICU unit. We have many, many families that we've been praying for for some time who are grieving, and we add to those this week, praying for Joan Cato and the loss of her brother David, the family of Reva Sali, who passed away earlier in the week, and Tim Oaks and the loss of his mother. And as we have been doing, we look around the world and we pray for all of those that are on the front line, whether they are healthcare professionals or educators, um, truck drivers, grocery store workers. Um, there's so many out there on the front lines right now, and we continue to pray for them. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, truly, you are gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and you abound in steadfast love. You are good. You are with us. 
You restore our souls. You draw near to us. Lord, we can never praise you enough for all of the ways that you continue to care for us and go on ahead of us. And at this time, O oh Lord, where there's so much swirling around us, we especially look to you for help. We look to you to make a way for the wild, um, through the wildfires, for people to escape, for a way for those that are fighting the wildfires, O oh Lord, to communicate with un each other and find the best way to contain the fires. We pray for those that are fighting a different kind of fire, O oh Lord, COVID-19, that you will multiply the medical supplies needed around the globe, O oh Lord, everywhere that it's in short supply, that you will multiply the resources needed, that you will sustain the healthcare workers, that you will invigorate and, and guide those in research, O oh Lord, to vaccine for COVID-19, to more effective medicines, not just for COVID-19, but for other illnesses as well. Lord, we pray for educators. We pray for families who are both working and helping their children learn online. We pray for those that have lost their businesses or their jobs. Those, O oh Lord, who are already caught up in the cycle of poverty, and this is even made each day, each moment, so much harder. Lord, we need your help. In every way, we need you going on ahead of us. We need you guiding us, helping us communicate better, working together, using all of the resources that you have given us and continue to give us, O oh Lord, that we can help one another and move forward to a much healthier place. Lord, we pray for those who grieve and we pray especially in our own midst for Joan Cato and the loss of her brother and Tim Oaks and, and the loss of his mother and the family of Riva Sali. We pray, O oh Lord, for deep comfort for them. And, O oh Lord, we pray for each of us. We pray for each of us, O oh Lord, that you will restore our souls, that you will strengthen us, sustain us, draw us ever closer to you. Show us how we can live fully for you and for each other in this time. And all the ways we have fallen short, O oh Lord, we ask for mercy. And we pray the prayer you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hi, I'm Caleb. I'm Parker. I'm Leah. We're the Cabinet siblings and we're going to sing a song for you today. This is a song based on a word that Jesus said when he was on the cross, tetelestai, meaning it is finished, meaning Jesus' work here on earth is done. And now it's, it's our turn. This is It Is Finished by Jimmy Needham. It is finished, it is finished, to tell a star. The beauty of the double meaning phrase. He ceased from his labor and so have I. Now resting only in his grace. It is finished, it is finished. To tell his star, the son of man succeeding where I failed, the wrath of God now satisfied in Jesus, my man. It is finished, it is finished 
to tell his story. My hope found in the Savior's words alone. He willingly laid down his life, and gloriously he rolled away the stone. It is finished, it is finished, to tell his story. Our first scripture today is from Psalm 51, verses 10 through 12. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. From Romans 12, verses 16 through 18. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. From Galatians 3, 26 through 28. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And from Luke 22, verses 19 and 20. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. shepherd I shall not want. 
He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let us pray. Lord, speak through me. If necessary, speak in spite of me. And always speak beyond me. Amen. It's one of my favorite old illustrations, and I've used it more than once because it adds a little levity, and we all need a little bit of humor these days. The story tells how one day two blind men who had been healed by Jesus, they happened to meet, and they were so excited to meet someone else who had been healed, and they talked about the wonder of sight, the colors, the flowers, the, the sunrises, seeing their families for the first time. And as they were laughing together, one of them said, and do you remember how Jesus took the mud, spit on it, and put it into your eyes? And the other fellow looked kind of stunned and answered, Why, no, Jesus simply said to me, Receive your sight, and I could see. The first fellow said, Wait a minute, now just wait a minute. You mean he didn't use any mud? No. Well, did he at least have you wash in the pool of Siloam? No, of course not. Who ever heard of anything so ridiculous as mud in your eyes? Well, said the first man, if he didn't put mud in your eyes and have you washed in the pool of Siloam, you are still blind because this is what Jesus healed me. This is the way he healed me and that's the way he does it. Then the second man began to get angry and he shouted, mud, mud, mud. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. You're the one who's still blind. And they got into a big argument and their relationship was destroyed. And right then and there, they formed the first two denominations, the Mudites and the anti-Mudites. Reconciliation, redemption, restoration. This is God's work. We have come to one of the most wonderful celebrations in the life of the church this morning, and it highlights God's work of reconciliation and restoration. Because today, as we get a little more serious, today is World Communion Sunday. A Sunday that witnesses to us what it looks like when we remember God's goodness and how we can share hope in a world that is longing to be restored. When I say that World Communion Sunday witnesses to us, I'm sharing with you again the history of this Sunday. It is a God-filled and God-blessed history because World Communion Sunday became a reality in 1940. So think back to your history for a moment. Its very beginning, World Communion's very beginning, was actually in 1936 at a Presbyterian church, a time of profound lack, where hunger and need were quite deep in the midst of the Great Depression. And then in 1940, the Federal Council of Churches led in extending this day to churches around the world. 1940, the cusp of World War II. People from countries around the globe of many different denominations came together and said we belong to one another. So ever since its beginning, people have walked to thatched roof stations across the lands of the Pacific, met in underground house churches in China, huge cathedrals, and little white churches in the countryside, and on this day, and heard again the words that we will hear this morning. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this 
in remembrance of me. This celebration helped the church remember the diversity within the church and the call of the church to be light and help to people everywhere, all people. That the table is meant to be for all people. That when the angels appeared to the shepherds before Jesus' birth, what did they say? I bring you good news of great joy for all the people. That God continues to invite all of humanity to know his goodness, to experience reconciliation and restoration. Communion points us once more to the truth that underlying all of the diversity in the world, there's unity. There's one creator, creator of all, and we are his creation. And God's desire is that all of his creation is in relationship with him and in relationship with each other that we all have that great assurance of fresh starts and, and forgiveness and the gifts of hope and peace. God's love knows no boundaries, just like a beautiful bouquet of flowers that's got roses and daisies and carnations, and for me it's going to need sunflowers and wildflowers, um, but creation is God's bouquet. You know, humanity with, with all of its differences is God's bouquet. Our recipes might be different, our clothing might be different, our houses might not or might vary a whole lot um, in style or decoration. Our differences are God designed and our coming together will only be as we accept God's design. Respecting and putting our trust first in God, which then leads us to respect and trust each other. World Communion is always timely, but I feel like it's even more so this year because this is the time for us to come together. We're truly all one right now, fighting one huge common enemy this year, COVID-19. And the wisest among us state repeatedly that we can fight this better together all across the globe. I remember that it was also in those years of the Depression and World War II that the United Methodist Committee on Relief had its beginnings. If you're not familiar with that, that's a kind of a global organization now, and millions of dollars were raised after World War II and during that time to help people rebuild their lives. And now after disasters, hurricanes and the wildfires, you know, after disasters happen, millions of dollars flow in to go to places all around the globe to help people rebuild their lives. Lives were restored then and continue to be restored because of this power of coming together. Restoration in the Bible is synonymous with repairing, healing, sometimes returning to a previous state. It's, it's a concept that you can follow from the beginning of the Bible to the end. In the Old Testament, we can find in the book of Amos that the people came back from exile and they rebuilt. We find that story also in Isaiah. In Isaiah 40, we read that those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. In Galatians 6, we are to restore one another gently. One of the strongest of promises found in the scripture is found in the 23rd Psalm, where God says to each of us, He restores my soul. I will restore your soul. The world has a way of battering our souls. Even worse than the wild waves in a storm or, or the fierce winds that threaten structures themselves, the world has a way of battering our souls. My guess is that you're a lot like me, that you felt your soul battered quite a bit in the recent months. Maybe you give 100% to your job or your families and all you get back is, is a harsh or a critical word. Or we can try to make amends in a relationship and be met with a hard heart. We can just get run down and lose our drive and, and we become less and less willing to attempt the difficult because we just see the obstacles. But God says to you and God says to me, I will restore your soul. God's waiting to breathe a new breath of life in us. 
World Communion Sunday every year finds us in the need of the restoration of our souls. And World Communion Sunday every year finds us still fighting another common enemy, and that's the enemy within us. Because the reason that we need reconciliation and the reasons that we need restoration are because of the enemies in our souls. Because of the fear and the greed and the pride that feed mistrust and feed selfishness and, and lead to us having a failure to genuinely care for and be willing to sacrificially and generously give to our neighbors. Psalm 51, our first scripture shared today, is a famous confession, and it's a confession that cries out for that restoration. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. Restore. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Sustain in me a willing spirit. If you have ever needed forgiveness from a friend or a loved one, you get this because there's joy with forgiveness. There is joy with reconciliation. I remember some years back, a church member approached me before Thanksgiving that, that year and he had the most wonderful look of joy on his face and he and his brother had been estranged for years and it was especially hurtful because they had been really close growing up and there were no other siblings, there were just the two of them. And he was elated, he came to me that day and he was elated because his brother had invited him to his house for Thanksgiving. Reconciled relationships bring joy. They restore our spirits. That's what God wants for us. The invitation brought new life. That's what communion is about. It's God's meal. It's God's gift to us. It's the gift of relationship. It's a symbol of God's deep commitment to you and me. And it is by God's invitation. Wednesday night of this week, some of us made prayer beads. I have them here. Um, and the first bead, I know it'd be hard to see from here, but the first bead that you put on the prayer beads, this largest clear bead right here above the cross, the first bead that you put on the prayer beads is called an invitatory bead. And that's because God is always inviting us to be in relationship with Him. God is constantly working on different ways to call us into relationship with Him. In the Bible, this is often framed by, by the word covenant, and the Lord's Supper, communion, represents a new covenant God made with us. And if you go back and you look at all the covenants in the Bible, there's some really good news about them. The first thing is God initiates them. Again, God is the one always inviting us to be in relationship with Him. The intent of the covenants is always to save, and they are always agreements of grace. God initiates them. The intent is to save, and they're always agreements of grace. So the Bible starts with the covenant. The Bible starts with creation itself, and, and God shows from the beginning that He wants to be in relationship with us because He calls on humanity to be fruitful and multiply, and He gives humanity dominion over the earth. That means making us managers of creation. From the beginning, we're created to be in relationship with each other and in relationship with God Himself. And then one of the other more famous covenants is the Ten Commandments, because God, God saw that people were struggling, humanity was struggling in its relationships with each other, and in its relationship with Him and trusting God. And God saw how much humanity was struggling, so He gave us the Ten Commandments, instructions to help us. God's covenants are not like our contracts. If you think of a worldly contract, quite often um, it favors the business or the business owner rather than the consumer. There might be a hidden fee down there somewhere, or it might cost a whole lot to break the contract. Um, a contract doesn't necessarily have your best interest at heart. God's covenants, again, are different because God initiates them. 
God's intent is to save, and they are agreements of grace. God wants to restore us. He wants us to be reconciled. So the gift of covenant is, again, that gift of personal relationship. Thus, the new covenant is Jesus, God himself, coming to walk on earth to show us that he understands our sorrows and our needs, that he's willing to walk through them with us, and indeed that he will go to any length to restore that relationship, even walking all the way to the cross. My favorite description of communion remains Thomas Hilton's words, the Lord's Supper is first and foremost the Lord's, because it is his supper, he is the host. He invites us. He hovers over the event. He is sad when we do not accept the invitation. He promises his presence. He will see to it that it is a significant event. So in communion, in communion, we know that Jesus is meeting us with forgiveness, with strength, with courage, with hope, that Jesus knows our sins and Jesus knows our own part in our brokenness. He knows that much of the brokenness is because of the enemy within. Jesus knows that, and yet he's ready to forgive us. God sees everything that is happening in the world, and God sees everything that is happening in our hearts. So today when we take communion, we can bring again our brokenness to God, and we can ask for God's mercy, and we can ask for God's help. Our musicians are, are singing a song today that sums it up fairly well. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. O wanderer, come home, you are not too far. So lay down your hurt, lay down your heart, come as you are. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. We're moving into communion now, so I encourage you to make sure you have your bread and your juice handy at home. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before our prayer over communion, let us join together in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us join in our communion prayer. Lift up your hearts and give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and sovereign of the universe. You love the world so much you gave your only son, Jesus Christ, to be our savior. He suffered and died for the sin of the world. You raised him from the dead that we too might have new life. He ascended to be with you in glory and according to his promise is with us always. On the night he offered himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, in remembrance of all your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we ask you to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, which we offer in union with Christ's sacrifice for us as a living and holy surrender of ourselves. Send the power of your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts, that in the breaking of this bread and the drinking of this juice, we may know the presence of the living Christ. 
Renew our communion with your church throughout the entire world and strengthen it in every nation and among every people to witness faithfully in your name. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your son Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit and your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And you are invited at this time to take your bread and your juice and to join together the body of Christ broken for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. And Lord, we receive your strength, your forgiveness, your comfort, your hope, your help once more. Amen. Humbled himself and carried the cross.